Now, if, if it's inescapable that morality is going to be imposed, and that's what law is, is the imposition of morality, then which morality? Should, do we want a corrupt one, a corrupt morality, or a good one? And now it's time for another interview on the Babylon Bee Podcast. Hi, guys. Welcome to the interview show of the Babylon Bee. It's so great to have you with us today. Is Sam always uh, with me. I'm Jarrett. And this is Doug Wilson is with us today. Hi. Such an honor to have you here. Thank you so much for flying all about. You got up at 2 in the morning to come here. I did. Such a big <laughs> thing. That's, yeah. a, that's an event. Well. Yeah. Not that big, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's but it was kind of nice. Yeah, it's kind of a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so you are um you are all about cross-cultural Christian classical education. You have written a million books. Um you are in the reformed camp I am. of Christianity and uh you are a controversial figure. You have a university. There's a lot of things going on. Right. Uh for you. And so um for our audience, can you just explain who you are a little bit? Sure. Yeah. I live in northern Idaho, mm -hmm. up in the Panhandle. The, <clears throat> in Moscow, Idaho, I'm the pastor of Christ Church. That's my day job, is um, uh, pastor. And I serve on the board of New St. Andrews College and on the board of Logos School mm -hmm. and uh, on the board of Canon Press, which is our publishing arm. So I serve on different board, boards, but my central task and calling is that of a preacher and pastor. Mm -hmm. And then I write a lot. You were saying that before you write, like you like a dog barks. Yeah, I, oh, I write for the same reason dogs bark. Don't <laughs> I, I can't explain it. <laughs> Constantly yeah, writing. You I, must well, be I, I need very to write. prolific. I have to write. Yeah. A fun, a fun naming convention note. We had some friends who moved uh, up to go to Moscow to be at Christ Church. And uh, we threw him a little going away party, and we made a on the letterboard signs. You know those signs that are so hip these days. It said to Moscow with love. Oh, that's great. <laughs> There you go. Now, from up there in cold, cold Moscow, Idaho, you all have, I mean, we at the Babylon Bee were a joke factory, but we also try to go where the center of gravity is in the conservative Christian cultural conversation. That's why we're in Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> so you all in, the, in cold, cold Northern Idaho have driven the Christian cultural conversation, or you've at least shifted the center of gravity towards this topic of Christian nationalism and now mere Christendom. What's right. the distinction between those terms? Is that a rebrand? Are they distinct? I see you have your Mere Christendom book. What's it about? And then what's Stephen Wolf's book about? So Stephen Wolf's book is sort of um, a, a, like a test case of Christian nationalism in a particular nation. What does it look like in one nation? Not what does it look like in America as the chosen nation, but what does it look like in one nation? Mm. And Mere Christendom is... Um, expanding. So it's just think of mere Christendom as zooming out. So, so what happens when you've got three nations that confess the Lordship of Jesus Christ? What's their relationship to one another? Right? So the first, the first Christendom, you had all these different nations that were Christian and they knew that they were Christian and they were at odds with each other sometimes and at war with each other sometimes. And, you know, you had all the normal nation things, but they thought of themselves as a unit, Christendom, as opposed to the Islamic world, let's say. All right, so that's, that's, basically, it's not a rebrand. It's, it's simply taking the, the conversation a bit larger, and it also helps to negate one of the accusations against Christian nationalism, which is that this is just a theological version of America first. No, it's not America first. It's um, nothing to do with that. So Christian internationalism, did you write it? So that puts to bed the, you know, the idea that maybe you wrote it because all the people were chanting, Doug has sold his thousands, but Stephen Wolf his ten thousands. It wasn't a jealousy thing. Uh, no, no. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Yeah. That's, okay, so you're thinking now for the person that is a little bit less educated on maybe some of what Christian nationalism is, because this is a really hot topic yeah. in culture. Right. Um, right now, we get accused of being Christian nationalists. I don't think we are. Uh, I think there's a lot of, um, especially coming from the Christian left, there's people that are accusing people that are saying, say, for instance, like, are, are pro-life that we're Christian nationalists, or like we have different positions right. that are more conservative that we're Christian nationalists because we're forcing our religion on other people or something like that. Sure. Um, what, how would you describe what Christian nationalism is? 
And uh, why is it a good thing in your mind, or why is it a yeah, bad thing? What's so the, here's the, yeah. the, you're you're touching the thing with a needle. This is the essential issue. Um, <clears throat> when when people say uh, you're trying to impose your morality on other people, mm -hmm. I'd say, yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly right. Yes, um, but and I hasten to add, so does everybody else. Mm -hmm. All law is imposed morality. It's an inescapable concept. It's not whether you impose morality, it's which morality you impose. So if someone says, well, you pro-lifers want to impose your morality on the mother. Well, I say, yeah, yeah, we are. <laughs> we want to say you can't kill your baby and you can't kill your baby because God said to Moses that you can't kill the baby. That's, yeah. uh, so that's, that's an imposition of morality. But that's not me coming in here to spoil the secular party where nobody's imposing morality and me coming in to ruin everything mm -hmm. by imposing morality. Because before I showed up, the mother and the doctor were go going to impose their morality on the child. Mm -hmm. Somebody, at the, end of, by, at the end of the day, someone has morality imposed on them. Now, if if it's inescapable that morality is going to be imposed, and that's what law is, is the imposition of morality, then which morality? Should, do we want a corrupt one, a corrupt morality, or a good one? And that's, that's what it boils down uh, to for Christians. Mm -hmm. So here's another way of coming at it. Um, all societies, all cultures, all societies, all corporate groups of humans are moral organisms. Any, any body of people that makes decisions can make bad ones, can make evil ones. So a corporate... Sam. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Mm. Total <laughs> depravity. I'm a capital T. <laughs> oh, that's where you're McCarthy. Yeah. Total yeah. depravity. Yeah, total depravity. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay. <laughs> no, not, ab not absolute Still. depravity. Total yeah. depravity. Yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> so um, if you have a, a nation or a, uh, a college or a corporation or any social unit, that unit is a moral organism, and it makes decisions. And those decisions will e can be c praised or blamed. And then my, one, my favorite question is, if you praise or blame, by what standard? What standard are we using to praise or blame? Now, if it's the standard of God Almighty, the true God, the living God, the triune God, Ta-da, Christian, welcome to Christian nationalism. Right, right. <laughs> okay. If it's not the standard of the living God, it's the standard of an idol. Mm -hmm. And why would any Christian want to support the imposition of an idol's standards? So what about what about pluralism? Like as we live in this society, an American society that's supposedly supposed to be pluralistic. Obviously, right. we're struggling with that right now. Right. Um, but what, what do we do? With that, like, how, how is this any different from the Christian version of Sharia law, you know? Well, um, the difference is the religion is different. The religion, yeah, it's just different. <laughs> the, 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 is the, it really? Yeah, I'm just kidding, I'm kidding. Yeah, well, if people think that, um, here's an interesting thing, there, there was a Supreme Court decision in 1892, uh, and the name of the d Supreme Court decision was wonderfully named the United States versus Holy Trinity. <laughs> which is well, That's scary. Uh, well, yeah. well, Holy Trinity was the name of a church, and this church called a British minister to come and serve in um, their pastorate. And then there, there was a law that prohibited the importation of laborers, cheap labor to you know work on railroads and that sort of thing. Uh, and so there was a court case that came out of this where the church was fined or attempted to be fined because they hired a British minister. And this case went all the way to, up to the Supreme Court. The name of the church was Holy Trinity in the United States. And the Supreme Court, I've read through this decision, the Supreme Court in 1892 um, determined on the merits, they said, no, this was not the intent of the law, blah, blah, blah. They, so they found in favor of the church. But then the Supreme Court went on to say, and furthermore, we can't have any truck with this nonsense because the United States is a Christian nation and always has been. Mm -hmm. And page after page, starting with the charters of the original colonies and the fundamental orders of Connecticut, the Declaration of Independence. <clears throat> so the Supreme Court of the United States mm -hmm. in 1892 
ter- determined that the United States was a Christian nation. Mm-hmm. Now, what I want to tell you is that in 1894, two years after that, it wasn't The Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> yeah. Right. Are you sure? I, I've only seen the first 20 minutes, but... <laughs> yeah, I've not Florida, seen it. Florida. Florida's The Handmaid's Tale. I couldn't tale. finish it. <laughs> I've not seen, not seen any of it, but I, but I know how that... Those I red know, outfits. I know how the trope terrible. works in our You're culture. Right. They, they say, you, if you allow for this... The first thing you're going to do is get some reformed weird beards, <laughs> um, uh, Ayatollah, reformed ayatollahs chopping off people's hands and stuff. Oh, but that's yeah. a different religion. That's not that's Islam. I'm not advocating for Islamic law. I'm advocating for Christian law, mm-hmm. and Christian law is not something that's this unknown thing. It's we ran it. We had it for centuries. <laughs> it's not this new newfangled idea. And and the thing, the next thing is, uh, and this ties into your pluralism question. Um, there's a good kind of healthy kind of pluralism and an unhealthy kind of pluralism. Um, healthy pluralism is something that Christians invented. So it was the Christ, uh, it was our Christian roots that hammered out the doctrine of liberty of conscience. Mm. We're the ones we're the ones who invented religious liberty. We're not the ones who, who are showing up late in the day to take l- religious liberty away. That's our baby. That's, we, <laughs> we, we hammered that out. We, uh, we developed that, and that was something that came out of the Reformation. And so what I'm arguing in mere Christendom, another way of saying this is Christendom 2.0, Christendom 1.0 made some serious mistakes. There, was some, there were blunders and crimes and things that mm-hmm. we don't want to do again. We don't want the Spanish Inquisition again. Yeah, you know there there are things we just don't want. We well, okay, we learn from that. Mm-hmm. But but here's the thing: there were a few thousand people in the history of the Spanish Inquisition. There were uh, a few thousand people executed, vilely, awfully, you know, bad, wicked. All right, but a few thousand people executed. I mean, that's Planned Parenthood on a slow afternoon. Yeah. Okay. And the Spanish Inquisition did what they did. Their crime was spread over a few centuries. Uh, so the, the the issue is, what do we have going on now? We're imposing morality now. It's just a wicked one, hmm. right? We're imp- uh, and so that's what this whole tranny debate is. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Call it what it is. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, that's good. Well, Automotive repair. That's why it was. <laughs> oh, were you talking about something else? <laughs> <laughs> the whole trend. That's what I was talking about. My transmission. <laughs> my brake pads, transmission. It's all gone yeah, to pot. I'm just not sure what I'm going to do with this. So, so um, bleep it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't bleep it. Keep it. So, so the, 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 we're, we're in the middle of hardcore debating over fundamental issues of life, sexuality, what is if if you can't answer the question what is a girl, then how on earth are you going to answer the question what is a human being? And if you can't answer the question what is a human being, then how on earth can you know what human rights are? The answer is you can't, mm-hmm. right? So we are we are headed for a hellhole, and we are headed for a hellhole with our eyes open on purpose. And when, if any Christian pops their head up and says, "Hey guys, this is not a good. That's the way to the abyss. Mm-hmm. This is <laughs> we're going to go over the lip of the abyss, and that's not going to be good." It's like, well, da- but then there's other Christians that pop up, like David French, right? I'm just going to say that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> In contrast to that, yeah. Honest. Well, so here's the here's the thing. When when David French says um, uh, that we want to preserve our institutions, I say, okay, yeah, I'm all for that. Who's burning them down, right? When uh, this goes back to Aristotle, uh, is is uh, do you want behavior that democracies like, or do you want behavior that preserves democracy? Mm. Okay, and what we're we're in the middle of a cultural revolution, right? Mm. This, this is the kind of thing that Mao launched in 1966 or thereabouts, and it continued until his death. We are in the early stages of a cult. It's, this is not culture wars anymore. This is a cultural revolution. Red guards and everything. Mm. And if, if pink you, guards, <laughs> pink guards, mm. yes. Um, and if so, when you have something like that appalling attack on a Christian school, six people murdered, and the White House press secretary says something like, "Well, the trans community is under siege." Are you 
Are you kidding me? That's so this is sort of up and up is down, down is up. This is Orwellian, um, or Orwellian language on steroids. And so when when someone says, like David French, well, we have to preserve our institutions, our, you know, say, haven't you, don't you realize that they're all blasted now? Don't you realize how much of it is in rubble now? Don't you, <laughs> it's like Pharaoh's, uh, Pharaoh's advisor saying, don't you know that Egypt is ruined? Uh, so... It, it, it's very. I I don't have a, any problem at all with us fighting for the religious liberty of Muslims and Jews and mm -hmm. people. Um, again, this is a Christian invention. So, like a neutral public square? No, no. Because the one thing a neutral public square can't do is preserve religious liberty, mm. right? The, um, because uh, here's the another illustration that I, that I like to use. If um, to illustrate how Christians have been snookered by the false kind of pluralism. Bamboozled. Bamboozled. That's how I like to say it. Mm. Yes. Have been, um, yes, bamboozled. That's the, perf that's the perfect word. <laughs> so if, let's say Walmart announced uh, Religious Appreciation Week, and, <laughs> okay. and Monday the Buddhists got 20% off, and Tuesday the <laughs> no. Muslims got 20% off, and Wednesday the Christians got 20% off. And, Suck your uh, tongue, uh, Monday. Uh, yeah. That's what it would be. Oh! Did you hear about the Dalai Lama? Yeah, that's what I heard about. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Gross. Yeah. Yeah. Bleep that. Tongue sucking Monday. <laughs> oh. So, yes, Gross. we all heard about that. I'm sorry. But we're not going to hear about it now for I'm very depressed. long. Thank you. Because <laughs> we're not going to hear about it if if we... If it was a Christian conservative Christian minister who said that, oh, yeah. we'd be hearing about it for years. Forever. Forever. <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry, I interrupted your thought. You were talking about Walmart. The Walmart, religious... and they have all these... Most Christians... <laughs> I love this. Uh, most Christians would be excited that they got a day. Yeah. Okay. And they say, well, see, Walmart's playing even, even handedly. They're given all these different religions a day, right? They're, so we have a neutral... This is sort of a, a a picture of the neutral public square. Satanic Fridays would be weird. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we're going to get. <laughs> that's where it's going to wind Seventh up. Seventh day Adventist But before Saturdays. before you before cool. you get to drag queen Saturday, drag queen yeah. Saturday. Sure. Before you get there, uh, you have to back up and recognize that Walmart's doing this for a reason, and every day is Money Day. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, every day is Mammon Day. There, in other words, you can't. You can't go to some place where there, where moral choices disappear, mm -hmm. right? And then as soon as you're making a moral choice together with your fellow Americans, the Christian has to ask, is this moral choice something that pleases God or doesn't please God? Mm -hmm. If you want it to please God, you're going to be accused of Christian nationalism. If you say it doesn't matter if it pleases God, you've sold out. You're, it's almost like you're saying you can't serve God and mammon. Mm. Yeah, you're you're quoting so you're quoting the Bible there. I I would quote Dylan. Yeah. <laughs> you got to got to serve somebody. You got to serve somebody. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, my um, father Dylan Mulvaney. My, my, yeah, Dylan Mulvaney said that. <laughs> yeah. So a couple a couple callbacks because uh, you know the, uh, well, I'm talking, I was talking about the Dylan from my generation. <laughs> Our generation who's, is who's way better than the Dylan. <laughs> from, we have a Dylan too. <laughs> we uh, have a Dylan heard too. Of, heard of him. <laughs> So a couple callbacks. Number one, I like it when Jarrett name drops David French. That just blesses me. At the end of the Christian nationalism. <laughs> I like nationalism, out the squishions. The squishions. Yeah, so jellyfish. at the end of the uh, Wolf's book, he all but name drops David French. He might have just been going for a more evergreen book, and he says there's always going to be a controlled opposition where they check a pro-life box, but then in every other way, right. they'll eternally punch right, and they will have as many weekly columns as they as they want. The left will gladly have mm -hmm. them as the... Punching right guys, right? But I do like that Jarrett name dropped. Well, him. well so well, the, yeah. is, how how can a conservative how can how can a conservative write for the Atlantic or write for the New York Times? You got to be full of crap, man. You, you, there's no way if if you were writing there and were effectively conservative, right? You'd they would grab you where the pants hang loose and march <laughs> you and march <laughs> you to the curb and. Kick you into your Uber. Well, so I imagine David French wears very tight pants. That's what I've always thought. <laughs> so as you tease it out and elaborate, uh, I think to the untrained ear, or maybe to the trained ear, who knows? I'll put it this way. To the untrained ear or to the untrained eye, the book looks and sounds scary. The Christian nationalism book, it's got a map of the U.S. with a cross spreading over it. And of course, if there were a 
hammer and sickle or a some other religious imagery, it would it would look scary. But I think you've softened it with mere Christendom. May I recommend a further softening? Country Christianity or Country of Christianity. It's go. got some nice Doug Wilson working on a banjo. It sounds on, like the untrained beard. The untrained beard. <laughs> <laughs> the uneducated. Well, the, the uneducated nose. One of, one of the things I'm trying to resist, and one of the things that is apparent in this project and. And Wolf's book and mine are part of the same general project. You know, we've got um, uh, Stephen Wolf is a Thomist, and I'm not a Thomist, and they're d- intramural differences. But I like what that, is that? What is a explain uh, that for, follower for Thomas, them for uh, them who might not know, for, not us, yes. not for me. Yes. I know asking, exactly what you're asking for a friend. <laughs> a Thomist is um, uh, someone who buys into and utilizes Thomas Aquinas's um, mm. s- uh, system of theology in analyzing ethical issues and the issues of cool. theology and so on. So I'm a Vantillian, Cornelius Vantill, uh, and Vantillian, and Thomism is more reliant on natural law, um, and I'm more biblicist, but I think there's room for natural law and natural revelation. So like I said, intramural uh, discussions. Mm-hmm. But I I'm, I'm, was very happy with uh, Stephen's book, <clears throat> and want to keep the conversation going. And in order to keep the conversation going, you have to anticipate and uh, answer objections. Now, and and also, you have to keep out of the well-worn groove. And the well-worn groove that I want to avoid is the God and country groove. Mm. Because there there are places in America where there, if you were just a moderate, squishy, center-left evangelical, and you went to a 4th of July service mm-hmm. you know, in Alabama somewhere, you would have plenty of material to say, these guys really are theofascists, you know, the, yeah. you know, flags and fighter jets and, you know. Yeah. That, uh, we had that up until like two years ago down here. Yeah, so I... I had um, that. See, here's, here's the... Uh, let me just shoehorn yeah. this in because this is very important. A lot of conservatives like to talk about American exceptionalism. And uh, and that's part of the God and country thing. Well, there's the real problems with it. Uh, and I do grant that the, our founding generation, when our country was founded, I do grant that the founding was exceptional. There really was American exceptionalism. But the exceptional thing about American exceptionalism was that the founders knew that Americans weren't exceptional. Hmm. <laughs> well, then... And this is why. If, you were, if you're a Martian or some foreigner and someone just gave you a copy of the Constitution that's just a year old, um, and you read through the Constitution, what's the subtext of that Constitution? The subtext is never trust an American. Hmm. Hmm. Right? Especially How, someone in government. Especially a politi- an yeah. American politician. They weren't, they weren't writing the Constitution against the British. The British were gone. Right, they were. They had all these firewalls in place, so, uh, the separation of powers, and then dividing Congress into two chambers, and then having the federalist system where you have all this, the states have um, uh, all this power that if it's not granted to the federal government, it re, it's reserved to the states or to the people. In the Tenth Amendment, they divvied up the power and spread it as thinly as possible. And the reason they did that is they didn't trust American politicians. They didn't trust us. And that was exceptional. Mm. So every empire in the history of the world, Babylonian exceptionalism, Persian exceptionalism, Roman exceptionalism, British exceptionalism, every empire on the top of its game thinks that they're unique. Mm. The founding founding of America, our founders knew that we weren't unique and that we were as corruptible as anybody. And they built a system that – was designed to retard and interfere with that kind of corruption. And the reason they did that was because of Christian nationalism. They did that because of a Christian doctrine of man. Man is a sinner, sinner. right? And that's what, that's what Madison says in The Federalist. He says, basically, you have to give the government enough power to enable it to govern the people and at the same time devise a means to enable it to control itself. Because every person who takes office is a sinner. Every, every person who's sworn into office as a president is a sinner. And power is going to go to his head, and you want to have a system that uh, uh, gets in the way, of, gets underfoot of any kind of power grab. And it was, a, it was a genius move, and it took a couple hundred years 
for the termites to eat through the floor joists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we're there now. We are. We're there now. And that means Christians have to replace the floor joists. And, and what I'm saying is that if we don't install the floor joists right, if we, if we don't do it the way they did it the first time, yeah. It's going to collapse after five years. It's just it's not going to it's not going to work. So Christian nationalism is not a rah rah America thing. Yeah. Well, you've got the ism on the end, and I think again the ism makes it scary to folks. But I think the deeper I think the reason it's going to you said it's raised objections, but you also said it's meant to forward the conversation. Yeah. I think the reason it's it's proving to be such an inflection point in the conversation is because it is grappling with real issues, like the silent majority seeming more and more like a myth, as well as the, as, well, I'll put it this way, as well as the, the movement from positive world to neutral world to negative world. It used to be, at least in the U.S., Aaron a positive Rose, world yeah. towards <clears throat> Christians, and then, you know, it was a neutral world. This is what Strand was saying recently on our podcast. Uh, it's okay that you're Christian, but now the negative world, it's bad that you're Christian. I think those realities have made this particular topic, a hot topic. So here's my question. Is Wolf's book and your book, are they meant to activate or persuade or both? Both. Both. They're, and they're, what, what material would you use for the floor joists? Uh -huh. Aha. Uh, just as a... 3D print. Would it be pressure-treated pressure wood or... <laughs> yeah. That's what, Term, I, would, that's what I would use. More termite resistant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're going to try uh, to find the pressure-treated wood right now. Yeah. Is that? <laughs> um, yeah, one of the things if, if uh, I like to tell people, you know, if I were if I were president, and what a glorious three days that would be. <laughs> if, um, I would I would want a bunch of process reforms, not just content reforms. Of course, I would want you know pro life and uh, protection of kids from the uh, transsexual movement, and all that. Yeah. But I would also want structural things that our founders put in, I, but uh, additional ones like term limits or right. uh, requiring elections uh, if that every ballot has to have none of the above on the ballot. <laughs> <laughs> and, That's funny. And, and if none of the above wins, mm -hmm. you have to have, a, uh, <laughs> have, to have the election over. Um, so Great. basically, you, you have to give people options where they're not just narrowed down to Mutt and Jeff choice Again, so those are those are process things that sort of um, get in the way of the people who are professional handlers of other people's lives, mm -hmm. and that and that's the thing that we need to figure out. Now, you you asked about um, motivating m motivating or uh, persuading. activating or persuading <clears throat> activating or persuading. I think and I think it has to be both. Because when someone is going into action, if they say, "Yeah, I've thought I felt this way for years," uh, man, you've stirred me up. When they go into a conversation, people are going to ask them questions, and they're going to need ammo. They're going to need uh, responses. And so, what I've done and sought to do since since 1988, it was in 1988 that I picked my target audience. That who am I writing for? Right. Well, um, who am I trying to? What am I trying to do? Who am I writing for? Uh, and that would include this book. I'm I'm writing for the average evangelical who is really distressed by everything he sees going on around him and can't quite articulate what's wrong with it. He knows that something's wrong with it, but he's not sure how to phrase it. Or and and so I want him to read what I write and say that's it. Hmm. That's that's what I. I didn't like about this. I wanted to fill out an instinct. Right. Well, if if I may filibuster for a moment to give you a chance to get some water. Okay. Um, <laughs> there you. was a clip that went around when they came up to interview you, and it was a 60 Minutes type segment where they were looking and, you know, they were talking about Moscow. And I remember the clip that either the Canon Press Boys or someone else, they uh, there was a clip where she said, well, Roe v. Wade uh, is the law of the land, and you said, or it was, and then they put the little thug life sunglasses on you and the little hat and everything. <laughs> yeah. That was a that was a moment where I real where I just I wondered, and forgive me for the directness, but I think it's worth letting you articulate it out loud. Yeah. Your whole schema is peaceful, correct? It's within the current laws. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, um, yes, absolutely. So, no Christian in his right mind would wish for or agitate for or um, try to bring about uh, civil war, 
Right. Right. Um, I have been warning people for decades that that's not the restraint that the other side has. Um, I read something. I just quoted it the other day. Um, uh, Aaron McIntyre uh, wrote, the strat- current strategy is for the progressive left to kick the dog until the dog defends itself so that they have a reason to shoot it. To put it down. To put it down. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So that's why I think we're being uh, insulted and exasperated. And, I'm, and I keep saying, look, you guys, if you keep this up, this is not going to be – this is going to get ugly. And nobody is going to be able to restrain mm-hmm. um, the forces that you're trying to provoke. But – Am I trying to provoke them? Absolutely not. Mm. So um, the the thing that I've wanted to do is have the leaven of the gospel mm. work its way throughout all society and have these things accomplished peacefully. I remember when you were it was a few months ago, actually maybe about a year ago, we were talking about one of the one of the January sixth um, celebrations that we had from the se- it was like the second year, the you know. The annual, anyway, but it was, it was, uh, uh, let me get to the question. Oh, uh, yeah. So you, you said something like, don't take the bait. He's like, yeah. you know, oh, do not take yes. the bait. This is what you were, and I loved it. That clip came across my feed as well. I loved that. Yeah. Cause you were, you know, cause you were expecting them to ex- like to poke the bear or something yeah, that like is, that at uh, that point. I, and I and think, said, please uh, don't take the bait. That's what's happening over and over that's and over. That's your again. advice, right? My now. advice is don't yeah. take the don't bait. Take the don't bait. take the bait. Don't take the bait. And, and in line with your, uh, question. So, that, well, if we don't take the bait, what do we take? If, if if we don't take the bait, I'm I love my country. I love my people. I love uh, what are, I hate what they're doing to everything. What do I do? If I don't take the bait, what do I do? Um, and I think the answer has to be reformation and revival in the church. Mm. Right. Um, it, I, basically, you cannot have. Uh, Jesus says, if salt has lost its savor, it's um, worth nothing except to be trampled on by men. Now, for modern Christians to come in and say, so why is the salt being trampled on by men? <laughs> <laughs> I just, this is a deep mystery. <laughs> oh, oh, we've taste, lost our savor. We've, well. we yeah. we've lost our savor. You don't taste and like the, you're supposed to taste. And the, lost, mm-hmm. and the, re- the savor is going to be restored mm-hmm. with the preaching of a hot gospel, mm-hmm. uh, true reformation in the church, true revival in the church mm-hmm. that isn't being aimed at a political end. Mm-hmm. It will have a it will have a political consequence, but that's not what you're doing it for. So you would not say, remember January 6th and keep it holy? <laughs> I would not say that. And that you would so say, well, you use the word exasperated. That came to mind to me because it was supremely exasperating to me when right after the tragedy in Nashville, Karine Jean-Pierre's, the clip that you know went around was of her saying the trans community is under attack. It, to me, it was the equivalent of her standing over kids hovering, you know, huddled under their desks and reminding them, don't forget, the trans community is under attack when they're the ones being literally attacked. Yeah. I think exasperating was the right word. Mm-hmm. Like, again, it would, to me, it felt like the equivalent of her going to the funerals and reminding everyone what the real story is about. So your solution is mass repentance and mass revival or starting in the church and then it spreads starting out from in the, the church, church. where Basically, the people of God in the pews calling upon their elders and pastors Mm -hmm. to take a stand, grow a backbone, take a stand. And I mentioned earlier that we're heading into a period of cultural revolution. In my – this is my read of the cultural circumstance, so take it for what it's worth. But I believe that the whole lockdown masking thing Mm -hmm. was was a beta beta testing for tyranny. Okay? So – how compliant are these Christians? Mm-hmm. How soft are they? How, uh, how easily will they go over? Well, it turns out that we folded like a cheap card table. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's a few standout exceptions around the country, and those standout exceptions have seen explosive growth because Christians are hungry for some sort of Christian leadership that isn't craven. <laughs> uh, and, but I think the... I think the real test is coming, and I don't know what the issue is going to be. It could be transsexual rights. It could be, hey, you can't worship. Uh, you've got. You can only worship once a month because of climate change. Uh, you know. Yeah, uh, that actually doesn't sound that far off. I, oh, I know. I know. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. And th- this is what. This is why uh, I've I've written satiric pieces for decades, and this is your 
wheelhouse. This is what you guys do. No, and you know that you know <laughs> how, what a challenge it is to out, uh, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> you write some satiric piece and then yeah. the week after it, it comes there, true. It comes true. We have about 100 prophecies fulfilled and we have a sketch about it where we're sitting around with two satire writers trying to write satire and they can't because the democrats have already done it yeah. <laughs> this, and the this republicans too you know. uh there's a great thinker uh, malcolm muggeridge was a yeah muggeridge. Uh, i read uh, uh, one of his books there, yeah. there was a he he, did, he used to be the editor of punch which right. was a satiric magazine and uh khrushchev was coming to the uh to the united kingdom one time and they wrote up a a, a satiric itinerary for him right to make fun of all the things that they were going to have him do. And then his actual itinerary fulfilled like half of the things on, this, <laughs> <laughs> on the satiric one. And it's like, okay, how can we, <laughs> how, <laughs> how can we keep pace with this? Now we're in the middle of clown world, right? right? And some Christians take encouragement from the fact, okay, we're in clown world. We're in a battle with clown world. That's the good news. Okay, fine. The bad news is the clowns appear to be winning. Yeah, and they have chainsaws. Yeah, and they have chainsaws. <laughs> creepy it's, clown world. It's, 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 creepy, it's clown. creepy clown world. And, it's like not scary farm or, out there. And, <laughs> and, and so what we have to do is say, okay, parishioners, Christian, uh, call upon your elders and pastors to take stand. These are times when the the Christian pulpit ought to be a place where it requires courage to preach. Mm-hmm. Okay, and the fact that it doesn't require courage to preach in many places means that a lot of men are not doing their jobs. Mm-hmm. So uh, I th- I think that the church needs to send a clear signal that we receive our commission from Christ. We are called to f- disciple the nations. We are called to worship Him. We are called to do certain things, and we don't require your permission to do those things. Right. There's a little obstinance about it. I feel like I feel that way. I kind of came to this revelation a couple of years ago. I've been in ministry for like 17 years. And I came to this realization that I wasn't really able to kind of speak my mind a lot, even in the service, even in church. And so that's when I joined the Babylon Bee. Mm-hmm. But, <laughs> so, <laughs> and, now we, and now we found out what you were thinking this all those years. <laughs> this is what I actually think, everyone. Uh, it's, been a little, it's been a little divisive. I've told, um, I've told everybody yeah. that I want inscribed on my tombstone. <laughs> I was holding back. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I was holding back, everyone. Uh, yeah, but see, here's the... Okay, so you're oh, talking about Christian leadership. Yeah, go ahead. If I may. Okay. Yeah. So, and then I'll get to the Christian leadership thing. Perfect. Don't, don't let me forget, because I like it. I won't let you forget. Okay, thank okay. you. The, the satirical piece, it, I was mulling over it yesterday because a friend notified me of an area of... We'll call it imbalance. No, it was rank hypocrisy. California is weighing the outlawing of Skittles, hot tamales, and double bubble at the same time that they're stockpiling abortion pills. And they're, you know, they're considering outlawing candy for toxic chemicals while they're safeguarding healthcare, abortion pills. The backwardness and the clown worldness of it was such that I could not quite push my brain to make satire. I thought, this is satire already. Were they banning Skittles because of the toxic chemicals or because of the underrepresentation of certain colors. <laughs> uh, was it a color thing or a combination? <laughs> <laughs> Probably both. I threw that in there back to you, Jared. <laughs> oh yes, I love it. Well you're talking a lot about Christian leadership and the need for, you know, brave Christian leadership. And um, this is a great time for it. And also moving forward when you're talking about your vision of what uh, New Christendom could look like, you you you're calling out Christian leaders. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a leadership scholar. I love I love leadership. I think it's really important. Um, I, have, I guess I have two questions, but one, one of them is, what is your, what's your philosophy of leadership? And then secondly, in the new kingdom, can I be, even though I'm a credo, Baptist, premillennial, dispensational, Pentecostal? <laughs> yeah. <Ooh. laughs> like, what a combo. You, no, I'm just kidding. I'm actually, I'm actually only a few of those, but yeah. <laughs> Look, you guys, right. you guys get your very own state. <laughs> oh! You're like you just stay over there. That's right. Okay, yeah, that's High great. Five. Actually, um, <laughs> yay! Well, that's great. One of one of the things that Stephen Wolf says in his book, and I think that he said that, um, he raises the question: Is there a place for uh, Baptists in this uh, Christendom thing? And he says, yes, there absolutely is. But given his Presbyterianism and his background, he said, I'm not the guy to do the theological heavy lifting to make that work. And the, the reason that that's an issue 
is because uh, in Pado Baptist communions, like Presbyterians, Episcopal, and whatnot, um, it is easier to have a, a relationship between the government and the churches because everybody born in this mm-hmm. area is sort of part of the uh, part of the deal. I thought you were going to say it's easier for a uh, camel to go through an eye of a needle <laughs> than no, for them I to would, enter in. Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> and, and I'm interested in the in the answer to yeah. Jared's leadership question. Yeah. So it, with Baptist um, uh, Baptist ecclesiology and soteriology together means that the congregation is a voluntarist body. Okay, a parish mm-hmm. is not right. Uh, you were born here, kid, you're one of us, <laughs> right? And we're going to teach you what that means to be one of us and what it means to be faithful and stuff. There's a whole theological divide. Um, uh, but I think Wolf is right that there is a Baptist case to be made for what we're talking about, but it would have to be uh, developed by convinced Baptists, you know. Um, but there need not be, uh, I mentioned earlier the uh, some of the errors of the first Christendom, one of them was Christians persecuting other Christians, mm-hmm. uh, which is not what you want. It was like right. the French and the English, and they were all Christian nations, right? They right. Fighting each other. Yeah, sometimes at wars, sometimes persecutions, Yeah, uh, that sort of thing. And um, Baptists have long memories, and uh, if someone says, if someone raised the question, where was your church before the Reformation? Mm-hmm. Um, now, a magisterial Presbyterian would say, well, where was your face before you washed it? <laughs> my, my church was the medieval church, right? With all the grime, and uh, we needed a reformation. Isn't that what we? Isn't that all? What all Protestants would say? No, Baptists would say, "Where was your church before the Reformation?" Baptists would say, "Hiding from you guys, mostly." <laughs> <laughs> That's Trying not to get it, drowned. It'd be. Yeah. It'd we don't be associate the, with the Catholic. The tra- tra- yeah, we trail of yeah. blood. We've been yeah. hiding in caves and that sort of thing. So, we're the true church, and we, you guys have always been. Yeah. Against. So um, there's that, and 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 here's the thing. I think every intelligent student of church history has to look at each one of these groups and say everybody has a point. Mm-hmm. Right, uh, the Baptists are skittish about uh, religious liberty issues because Patrick Henry, for example, could recall the time when a Baptist minister in Virginia was flogged for for being a Baptist minister. Mm. Oh, okay, okay, we don't want that. No, uh, so we want. Let's not uh, do that. And this is if if I could, um, I don't want to. I know some good. Uh, I, I don't want to be a rude guest here, but I just want to interact with one thing. Part of the reason this came about is because. You interviewed Scott Clark on the same yeah, right. uh, on the same topic, <clears throat> and in the Westminster Confession, um, chapter twenty three on the civil magistrate, there's the British version and the American version. Okay, on this issue, I am historic confessionally reformed. Okay, I'm so I would um, I'm more comfortable with the American version of chapter twenty three. Our church subscribes to the original British. Um, uh, version of the Westminster Confession, which allows the magistrate to summon synods and councils of the church uh, and to be present at them <laughs> and and gives them a great deal of authority to determine what what is determ- what is decided is whether it's in accordance with the Word of God. In the American version, it says that the magistrate is to be a nursing father. Uh, as Christian, basically, it's it's presupposing denominational differences. We all serve the church of our common Lord, and the magistrate is to be supportive of that. <clears throat> so take the weaker one, which I think is, in this case, a, uh, a better version, the weaker st- standard of the Reformation in the American uh, 1789 version of the Westminster. I subscribe to that. And Scott Clark, on this topic, doesn't. Right, he he's one, on on the on the issue of church state relations, on the issue of Christian nationalism or or Christendom, uh, Scott Clark is simply a modern evangelical. Okay, and in other areas he's confessionally reformed, but the the Puritans, the reformers, um, they had um, a tightly reasoned, worked out theology of how the state and the Church, we're supposed to interact, mm. and there there are three basic 
ways you can structure this. One is the, uh, think of the medieval papacy, where the church is over the state. Okay, the, the pope is in charge of all the countries. That's the medieval papacy, church over state. Then there's another position called the Erastian position, after a guy named Erastus um, mm-hmm. in the Reformation era, who said the state is over the church. Okay, that's the second arrangement. Mm-hmm. The third arrangement, I think the best name for it would be Kuyperian, after Abraham Kuyper, where you have different spheres, the sphere of the state, the sphere of the church, the sphere of the family. These are all governments. Family government was created by God directly. Mm-hmm. The ch- government of the church was created by God directly. The civil magistrate was created by God directly. None of them get their authority to exist from the other two. Right, so they they are independent institutions, and they have areas where they touch and overlap, and have to work at, and they have to work out what they're going to do. So I'm a Kuyperian, and I believe the American Westminster uh, Confession is, in essence, Kuyperian. It was written before Kuyper, but it was, in, in essence, that was the solution. That is a reformed, biblical, Protestant, evangelical pluralism. Right, mm-hmm. it's not. Who's to say what truth is? Pluralism. Because as, as soon as you say, nobody knows what the truth is, um, come one, come all, that's not pluralism, that's anarchy. Mm. And, and you've, you've got people insisting that we are living in a time when in the name of pluralism, they can chop babies up and sell the pieces. Kuyperianism, and I, I love it. And uh, You're doing th- this is fun it. getting to host like a proxy war between Doug Wilson and Scott Clark. <laughs> yeah, I like a it. Proxy or di- our, proxy. A, a proxy discussion. Our, a, a proxy a, discussion. A proxy ironic roundtable. Oh, that's You guys better. will work this out when you're both in heaven. It's going to be great. So yeah. That's so true. That's right. Or when we're both in the cattle cars being held being off to the camps. To, the- to AOC's <laughs> gulags. <laughs> we'll be there too. Yeah, I, well, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you, guys, you guys are going to be in the front car. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be there first. The first no, wave you guys of arrest. Might be there, I don't know. I don't know who they're going to come so, after first. So basically, how elastic is pluralism? How far can it go? Mm-hmm. Uh, right? You're mutilating kids, right? And and so the states, Idaho just, uh, our governor just signed a bill outlawing um, um, surgeries and transsexual surgeries on kids and that sort of thing. Uh, so we're gl- very very glad for Idaho. That's wonderful. And I think about 17 states have done this. But it's controversial. <laughs> it's it's when when we say, hey, man, uh, don't chop the bait. You know, can, mom, can I buy cigarettes? No, you're five. You know, mom, can, can I uh, buy some Seagrams? No, you're five. Can I borrow the car? No, you're five. Uh, can I be a girl? Can I get a tattoo? Well, <laughs> can I get, no, no, you're five. Can I, can I change my sex? Oh, sure. whatever you say, Johnny. Yeah, whatever you say. Um, this is just, this, it's demen- this is demented. Can I buy Turok too? Oh. It's a video game. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. So uh, the, the critiques of broader Christian nationalism in Christendom have abounded. Uh, they've proliferated. I've got a, a mild critique. Uh, we've been talking about intense stuff. One fear is that the church will become, you know, if the government takes it over, the government mucks up everything it touches. And uh, would you say that there's any danger that if the government and church are one and the same, or that there's an established church, would you say there's any danger that the church will be like the DMV? Yes. (laughs) Yeah, who wants to worship in a service run by the DMV? (laughs) Not me. So not me. No. So thank you. This is a great question. There's a distinction between theocracy, which every society is, uh, what's the god of the system? Mammon. Okay. Right now. Mammon. Yes. Mammon yes. or Allah in uh, certain yes. societies. Allah is the god of the system. Uh, in ours, it's Mammon. Uh, it used to be uh, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a theocracy in that sense is not the same thing as an ecclesiocracy. So an ecclesiocracy is where the church runs. Like That's, that's what you have in Iran, uh, in Iran yeah. with the Ayatollahs with control. I am death on ecclesiocracies. I don't want an established church. Right? I don't want to, because I, as you point out, I think that would be the kiss of death f- for Seems that established to have been church. In the past, yeah. yeah. Well, and that's what Kuiper argues in a, yeah. in a book um, he wrote called Our Program. Uh, he is arguing that the the government of the Netherlands. He he was the prime minister of the Netherlands at one point. He said the government of the Netherlands needs to be explicitly Christian. 
and there needs to be no established church. Right? So uh, establishing a church is not the same thing as having your, your civil compact recognize that Jesus rose from the dead. So what I'm wanting, and this this goes back to the Holy Trinity case in 1892, they didn't establish a Christian denomination. They just said, look, America's a Christian nation, deal with it. We're generically Christian. We have uh, all these Christian traditions. We're a Christian people. This is what we this is what we are. But and they did that without establishing any state church. Okay. Now there's one other thing that should be said, and that is when the First Amendment was uh, adopted, uh, where Congress shall make no law concerning the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Right now, we're in the middle of prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Mm. Uh, that's that's the full court press. But the only entity that can violate the First Amendment is Congress. Congress shall make no law concerning the establishment of religion. When they adopted the First Amendment, when the First Amendment was adopted, out of the 13 colonies, nine of the 13 colonies had a formal relationship with the Christian denomination. So now, um, like for example, and, and Connecticut's was with the, uh, had a relationship with the uh, um, Congregational Church, which lasted down into the 1830s. Now, I'm against state, sponsor, uh, state church at the state level. I, d- I don't uh, want to see that happen in Idaho because it'd be the kiss of death for whatever church that was. But if they were to do that in Idaho, it wouldn't be unconstitutional because yeah. the men who framed the Constitution, they, they didn't make a church of the United States the way there's a church of Denmark or a church, church of England. England. Right. They, they didn't do that because if you have a national bird, the bald eagle, it doesn't bring you into conflict with Maryland that has the Oriole as the state bird. Or if you have a national flower and a state flower, it doesn't produce any conflicts. But if you had the Anglican Church in Virginia and the Congregational Church in Connecticut, and you made the Episcopal Church the Church of the United States, you're just asking for civil strife between the different states. Mm-hmm. So the the refusal to make a Church of the United States was not neutral secularism what it was was peacekeeping between christians <laughs> yeah right we we want to have our christianity embedded in this federal system now i think at the state level um having a state estab- a state sponsored church at the state level is not a good idea but it's not an unconstitutional idea i would prefer to have um if someone said what do you want to do then well i'd like to have the apostles creed Included in the Constitution, okay. and and just say we affirm that Jesus rose from the dead, and Christianity is uh, woven into the texture of our customs, our laws. It's the foundation of everything. You can quote a Bible verse in a court decision without it being the end of the world. But I don't want tax money to going go to, to a particular church, going to the, especially the Lutherans. Look what happened in Germany. <laughs> uh, no, but I. So yeah. it's interesting. So maybe I'm dense. I'm trying to think. We were talking about for a while the um, the coexistence of the Reformed denomination with the Baptists, mm-hmm. and how they just would have to like not coexist, like they would okay. live in separate spaces. A- actually, that was a joke. It's kind of a joke. But is <laughs> well, that, no, it was but, a joke. But we, <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it wasn't kind of a joke. joke. <laughs> so, but we, but we're saying um, you are not actually advocating for the Charismatics to be like sent to El Paso or something. No, what I'm what I. <laughs> Unless the Lord told them, to yeah. Go. <laughs> oh, nice, good answer. <laughs> so if, um, uh, so basically, I think that uh, any person who wants to, let's say, you've got a, a Christian establishment, not an ecclesiocracy, but a generic um, recognition that we are a Christian people, and let's say that uh, that that would mean that in a uh, in a state where there was a, there were many Lutherans, let's say Wisconsin or somewhere, um, and someone wanted to plant a Southern Baptist church there, they'd be free to do so, right? And uh, the the, diffi- the difficulty would be, and this is where people want to run ahead five hundred years and push everything into the corners uh, and say, well, what about a mosque? You know, that's what, what I was about to ask. Okay, what about a mosque? And I would say yes, uh, and this is me being president for a day, three days, 
Um, <laughs> yes to a mosque, but no minarets. Okay. Okay. Uh, um, in other words, the church bells occupy the public space. Mm-hmm. And and if someone says, oh, you mean you wouldn't let the Muslim call to prayer fill the public space? Right. 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 But would Muslims be free to uh, live in America and do, you know, yeah, yeah. They, yeah. they would. Under uh, American law. You under say. America, and, but yes. Not under Sharia law. But under, yeah. Correct. Right. That, and that's, yeah. that's the thing where I believe, I believe that Muslim, uh, m- Muslim rights are going to be protected more under Christian law than under Sharia law. Okay. Mm-hmm. So if you, now it used to be that I would, uh, I could say, well, under Sharia law, they, uh, in certain, depends on what ethnic group they're from, uh, they practice um, uh, genital mutilation. And what that'd be, that should be against the law. But now we can't talk that way anymore because we're the ones practicing genital mutilation. We're, we're the ones doing it. Yeah. Uh, for, in service of a different God and for different reasons. But mm-hmm. we're doing that. Christian law would ban it all. Christian law would say, leave, uh, echoing Pink Floyd. Leave those kids alone. <laughs> leave those kids. Leave those kids it's alone. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> it's a good song. Um, the Serrated Edge. Yeah. So I read the Serrated Edge. I I got a lot of criticism when I first started working here because I'm in ministry, and um, for you know using satire and for making fun of the church or for calling out different hypocrisies that we see. Um, right. And now I'm associated with all this. So one of my friends, uh, his name's Eric Tanis, recommended the. Serrated Edge, which I read and I very much liked. I think it's a great treatise on uh, how Christians can handle and what had Christian justification for right. satire. Right. And uh, so, anyway, can you just you know speak to that just yeah. really briefly? Because I, I think yeah. for us, it's really an important topic. So, I, so <laughs> yes, so. we're in the same line of work, and I've had I've had to field this objection for forty years or a you know, long or a long time. Anyway. Um, and when people come to me, uh, let's say I'm, and I don't do this all the time. It's not like it's nonstop uh, making fun of people or things. Uh, when I'm preaching, when I'm preaching on Sunday, it comes up rarely, but when I write, it comes up more frequently, depending on the topic. And so, on. so people have pushed back for years, and they come to me and they say, the first thing we'll say is, "What you're doing is not Christ-like." Right. Okay. This is just not a Christ-like thing to do. And I'd say, great, that's a substantive uh, objection. Mm-hmm. Let's have a Bible study. Yes. Okay. Remember that part. L- all right. Let's. Yeah. Uh, what? How did Christ talk? All right. Um, what? Matthew twenty-three. Uh, Matthew twenty-three. <laughs> right. Let's what go. What do you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites? Who told you that you? Anyway, um, Christ unloads on them. He. Uh, he so Christ ha- ha- has used bite, uses biting humor, uh, colorful expressions. Uh, so you can't say that Christ was unchristlike, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then the thing is, well, yeah, they'll, they'll say, okay, that's biblical, but you're not Jesus, pal. You, yeah. you, you know, you, uh, that's true. Well, that, so, but do you ever say that to people who are volunteering in soup kitchens? Nice try. <laughs> yeah, you're not, you're, Jesus, you're not Jesus, man. What do you think you are? <laughs> you think, yeah, Jesus Feeding exhibited that, love and compassion, you but you're not even Jesus. Try. Yeah. You don't even try. Yeah. Right. Okay. Now I. I acknowledge that when I use satire, um, there have been, shall we call some satire fails, you know, oh, right? We got swing, those. You swing yeah. and a miss, and yeah. or you hurt. You, um, Oscar Wilde once said that a gentleman is someone who never insults someone else accidentally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. There you go. So sometimes you'll you do something or you say something, and it, all of a sudden there's a situation over here. And you know, oh, I didn't mean that. that's not what I was swinging at. That, yeah. you know, so their satire fails. Why? Well, because I'm not Jesus. Right. But that is no excuse or reason to not try. Yeah. Uh, the, our goal is to become like Jesus. Not, and we're not going to get there perfectly or altogether. But this is true. You know, can love become toxic? Right. Can can volunteering for the downtrodden? Can that become sentimental and? Can yeah. problems develop there? Yeah, you're not Jesus. But that's no reason to quit. That's a reason to uh, give yourself back to the Word. And I like st- uh, one of the things that you were saying is that all of these types of communication and lifestyle are available to us because Christ, you know, Christ engaged in these types of right. communication. So we're able to do that too. 
right. we're Christians, he did it, we can do it as well. And if people say he's the son of God, and I say, okay, but yeah. Amos, Amos wasn't the son of God, That's and the true. book and the book of Amos is satire. Right. Um, you, you've got Elijah, m- multiple examples. Elijah, multiple examples. Yeah, that of- was the one. That was the one headline. That was one of the one headlines that I got pitched that that passed through. Is what is it? Elijah criticized by by Israel for unloving satire, satire towards the prophets of Baal. <laughs> so good. <laughs> That's exactly right. Now, but so then when when you say okay, let's have a Bible study and you hammer it out. Okay, okay, okay. Maybe it's biblical. Maybe you are you. You're so doctrinal and Bible man and everything, um, but it's just counterproductive. Bible man. Uh, um, you, it's just counterproductive. You're turning people off. Well, in my experience, it's just the opposite. Right. Um, Christians are so fed up with the mealy-mouthed approach <laughs> to the faith that when someone articulates clearly, uh, Paul says, if the bugle blows indistinctly, who's going to get ready for battle? Um when you have, when you use satire, you're not only making your point clearly, but you're making your point in in a way that indicates a willingness to fight. One of our uh, writers at the B wrote a premium article on exactly this topic, yeah. and then he wrote a follow up. It was called "Should Christians Mock?" Um, that's one of the great things you get at babylonbcom slash plans. Sign up for a subscription, you get access to extra articles. Joel Berry. Uh, that was actually Jason. Oh, that Jason. Yeah. Jason McGuchigin. <laughs> different yeah, Jason. Right. Oh, different Jason. <laughs> well, one of the things that... So, I mean, again, it's a ripe topic, but there are answers. One of the things that I liked in the Serrated Edge book is when you said, yes, it's like you want to steal man, your opponent, out of uh, charity, but also... Sometimes you can't steal man a straw man. You didn't set up a straw man to knock down. There's a straw man there and you... <laughs> blow on it and it just topples. Right. So right. you you made the argument that if there is a straw man, it's fair game, correct? Yeah, correct. If the if the straw man if you're not making manufacturing a straw man to attack instead of their formidable case, that that's a um fallacy. That's that's just bad manners, bad form, yeah. bad everything. Uh but it's not bad form to take what they've said and make it ridiculous by putting it in a format where everybody sees how ridiculous it is. Either by understatement or exaggeration. Well, people do it to us too. The uh, The Onion just released uh, an article about two days ago about the Bud Light thing with Dylan Mulvaney. Yeah. And it was essentially a straw man. It was like, man has to drink something else before he beats his kids now. <laughs> and it's just like, that's a straw man. That's not what we're saying. That's not the reason why, you know. It's just yeah. kind of a. I mean, it was I like guess a caricature. It was okay, but it was a caricature of of everyone that's conservative that drinks Bud Light, and we don't. We tend not to do that uh, with our satire. So I we, know, we, we tend to steal. We tend it. to steal man as much as we can, but sometimes you can't yeah. steal man a straw. straw. Man. <laughs> right, you can, yeah, because that's can't make not the criticism, not. right? Anyway. Well, so the serrated edge book. That's something we can all like pat each other on the back about. Yeah, it's a good one. There's other books you've written that yeah. have drawn ire. Coming up next. For Babylon B subscribers. Doug Wilson says slavery is, and you're like, oh, bad. Uh, but, yeah. but, and you know, Doug Wilson says, but, and you're, uh, so why, yeah. why? People of God for a time were prohibited from eating shellfish. But your position holds that all of us at one time used to be shellfish. There's yes. another topic that's given you many gray hairs, perhaps rightfully so, okay. the federal vision question. Whatever you do, don't apologize for the Bible. This has been another edition of the Babylon Bee Podcast. From the dedicated team of certified fake news journalists you can trust here at the Babylon Bee, reminding you to read C.S. Lewis. Really, he's got some good stuff. 